This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This episode is sponsored by C-School, the online school for creativity training. If you'd like to unleash your creative potential and access a free creativity blueprint training series, then just head over to c.school. That's www.c.school for your free training series. In today's episode, I speak with James Mapes, and we talk about creating a vision statement, why everyone should take an acting class, and what James did when he was told he only had two weeks to live. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to be joined by James Mapes. James is a modern renaissance man, combining life as a speaker, peak performance coach, best-selling author, clinical hypnotist, award-winning performer, and professional actor. Indeed, the Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen once quizzed James on how he was able to get so much done in his life. His answer? Because no one told me I couldn't. James is considered as one of the world's foremost authorities on applied imagination and inspires, motivates, and educates others on developing the unlimited potential of their creative imagination. His latest book is called Imagine That, Igniting Your Brain for Creativity and Peak Performance. And it's my great pleasure to have James join us today. So welcome, James. Well, thank you so much. I listened to that introduction, and it makes me want to go back to bed. It's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> you is any any secrets? You get so much done. I mean, I, I was looking at your your bio early and and just checking all the kind of incredible things that you've you've done with your life. Is 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 there a secret to being able to squeeze all the juice from life? Well, I, I listen. I think it's because I was bullied as a kid, and I had ADD. Uh, so my, my, I took my brother camping this year for the 48th year, and, and he brought my report cards from high school, and they were all C minuses. They said he's a great guy, he's very creative, but he can't pay attention. And the second thing, I have mild dyslexia, so I think that I had to, I had to ramp up my game uh, in order to get through um, uh, my education, my university. And, and it's funny because my mom and dad, when I was very young, uh, told, said something to me in high school. They said, when are you going to settle on one thing? And, and so, so I often joke with my wife, I can still hear my mother asking that question. And I said, I can't, I said, no, probably not because I'm, <laughs> you know why? Because I'm curious, which is, mm. <clears throat> which is one of the, the first, uh, uh, passion and curiosity are, are two of my top, um, points for what I call living an exceptional life. And I am, I just, I get, I, I, I try to master whatever I'm doing and then I get curious. It leads me to something else. And I think in our profession, uh, it, you get paid to learn. And if you keep learning, uh, you keep growing. And if you keep growing, you have new information to share with people. So what has your focus just now? What, what's, um, what are you working on at the moment? Well, I'll tell you exactly what I'm working on. Number one, I am uh, promoting the heck out of this book on, on almost a daily level. The second thing is I'm putting together a new talk, which I do on December 1st, uh, based on my TED Talk, which is uh, harnessing your imagination for a wellness strategy. So I'm very much into, uh, mainly because I was hired to do this, but it's turned into me teaching my first uh, hypnosis uh, breakout sessions afterwards. They just asked me to do it, and I thought that would be grand. Uh, and I'm, I'm working on a screenplay that's a, a psychosexual thriller based on a real hypnosis case I had many, uh, many years ago. And I've got a new one-man show that I'm launching. So that's what I'm doing. Wow. So you've got, I, I was just looking earlier, I mean, you have some incredible uh, corporate clients you speak to as well. And you, you work with, I mean, IBM, Lockheed Martin, the Pentagon. Did you find it hard to sell the idea of creativity and, and speaking on creativity to this kind of more corporate market or government market? Well, I was very blessed because I had a manager for 37 years and I was with Washington Speakers Bureau for 27 years. And if you know anything about Washington Speakers Bureau, they're very politically connected. So I created, in addition to the creativity, uh, a workshop on, on leadership based on something very weird. Uh, the president of Omnicom uh, hired my team to do this. 
and it and I'll give it to you very quickly because the the program was an interactive program on DVD that um, was the five traits of a true leader that were morally and culturally neutral. Now, just think about that for a second. Moral. So you can't say honesty. You can't say integrity. You can't say um, uh, anything to do that you would learn culturally or, or morally. So once I got, and that's one of the reasons I went to the Pentagon and the Army to, to, to teach these five traits. And one, you kind of work with all these incredible um, clients uh, as well. And, and one of the things I, I loved about your site is you have a very, you know, forward, like right in the center there about living an exceptional life. And we talk here about like living a creative life. And, and, I, and I saw so many um, similarities in terms of what you were talking. And you talk through these, these five steps to living an exceptional life. It start, you mentioned kind of starting with, with defining, the, <laughs> defining the, the thing itself. Can, can you talk kind of briefly about that? And I want, then I want to kind of get into this, this new book as well, because it seems to, to link very well into that area. Well, yeah, yeah. I, an exceptional life, I, I, over the years of coaching, I've just noticed and speaking, uh, putting together uh, the, the points that I, that I see that people that really soar, that suck all the juice and, and, and one is having purpose. I'll do this very quickly because it's, a, um, and you can stop me anytime. Two is being curious. Three is saying yes to opportunities. <clears throat> and my mother taught me that years ago. And my wife lives that way <clears throat> and always saying yes. I'm like jumping the lion's den to, and then I figure out how to fight the lion. Uh, Committing to lifelong learning, it is so important. I try to say this to young people is the more you learn, more it enhances everything. Uh, and also focusing on what you can control and letting go of what you cannot. I, I mean, this may be an exaggeration, but I believe that the majority of people spend the majority of their time trying to control that which cannot be controlled out of fear. So if you can really define what you can control, then you ramp up your your ability to live and becoming a partner in your own wellness. Uh, I was raised, my mother was a nurse, but still doctors were gods, you know? So, and now we've got the tools where we can, you know, be accountable and, and be part of that. Uh, and also making uh, short-term sacrifices for long-term payoffs because the subconscious, we can talk about this later, really doesn't want to do that. We're not designed to do that. Uh, committing to self-knowledge, that's what we're talking about. It's really learning about your your mental process, your machinery, uh, taking responsibility and being accountable for creating your life, uh, acknowledging grievances, letting them go, forgiving. And the last one is applying your imagination, learning how to do this to influence your subconscious mind. So all those, they're all kind of traits uh, that lead to this, this uh, exciting uh, uh, life. Now that doesn't mean, and I should say this up front, we don't have grievances. We don't lose people. We don't get sad. We don't get angry. It just means that we're able to let go faster of the negative. Now, one of those things that you mentioned there was, uh, s saying yes to opportunities. And I know that a lot of very creative people that I speak with, whether they're entrepreneurs or the musicians or the uh, actors they maybe get to that stage in their career where they have an abundance of opportunities coming their way um when you coach clients maybe when they're in that position and when they're getting so many opportunities that they can't perhaps say yes to everything they have to start making some decisions there how how should they start should it be going kind of where where their heart is going and leading them to or should they be taking a more strategic approach well, I, what I do, there are two exercises that I talk about in the book. One is on video. <clears throat> and by the way, I'm going to just do this so we understand what we're talking about here. This book took 13 years. It's the first hardbound book that has 21 video links and two audio links. So I try to coach people. They have a choice. It's all written down. But one of, one of this is an exercise that I created for hospice years ago. And it's a very intense exercise. You have 25 squares. You go through the squares. There are five categories. And you list the five most important relationships in your life, the five um, plans you have for the future or dreams. And you go down there, five categories. And then I push people to throw away all but four of these. So as a client that comes to me, and it's very stressful, you end up looking at this today, at now, what are the four top life priorities? And the second thing I had them do right away is list five of their values. And 
then I teach them a system to combine this to create a compass. It's very short. It's only like a little paragraph. And I do that. Once the compass is there, then I can talk about what we're talking about, but not before, because I'm not, a, I'm not in a position to say, well, you should take this or you should take that. But I will tell you a story. I am a child when it comes to film acting. Uh, literally. I mean, I almost will do that and I'll pay people to do it because I love it so much. And so I, <clears throat> years ago I was offered the phone ring and I had a conference to prepare for in wellness. I had something to do in leadership. I had three coaching clients. So a friend of mine called up and said, uh, you know, would you like a part in a movie? Yes. When is it? Two weeks. I had a full schedule. I was actually going to cancel everything to go do this movie. So I look at what I call my vision statement. And I read it over and I realize that the vision statement is my true north at this point, moment in my life and my compass. And I, and it was hard because I read it. I said, look, you're going to teach this stuff. You have to have some kind of a compass to guide you to, to, to live all these through all these choices. So I had to turn it down it made me sad, but it was the right thing to do for the big picture of my life. Does that answer the question at all? Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, this is the thing I've, I've all, always wandered around when it, people talk about this kind of vision or vision statements and setting that that compass as well. Is is a vision and a, and a vision statement something that you should be thinking of in terms of more kind of medium term rather than like as in thinking three to five years as a vision that way? Or should you be thinking much further out? Uh, well, I, you know? I, I okay, got it. Uh, I... First of all, a vision is unattainable in my, my being. You cannot attain it. So that means, imagine you take a rubber band and you stretch it out to the future and you wrap it around a goal. That creates tension. So you start to move forward and what happens to the tension? It diminishes. So the rubber band's tied around the future. You start to move towards it, but the tension lessens. And as you get towards a goal, you may have to get a little more uh, inner strength to, to complete the goal. Now, what a vision statement does, it goes well beyond goals. Uh, because if you only lead a goal-directed life, you're either successful, you fail, or you feel incomplete. But with a vision, it's like a passion. Mine has to do with sp creativity, spirituality, not religion, but spirituality. It's a, it's a paragraph that I have, and that ties a rubber band around... Uh, you, you recreate this every three months. So you're, you know, because we all change and grow, but the, then the goals fall within the pull of the passion. So you, so this, you always know where your kind of true North is. You're always kind of pulling yes. your, yourself. It's, I guess it's, it's a little bit like, you know, when you go out on a, on a boat, it's kind of having that, having that rudder there and just having to make small corrections a, along the way That's right. that's in, in the goal. Yeah. yeah. And whenever you go five years out, that's still a goal. <clears throat> and that's okay too. You know, nothing wrong with that. Uh, although I don't know that that is as powerful today as it used to be with a with the change that goes on in the <laughs> world. So, <laughs> so, you, so you mentioned talking about that, that that book that took you fourteen years to write. Um, you know, I know many of our listeners are either writers or they're maybe thinking about writing a written book. Fourteen years. Talk us through that process. You know, what was that? What was that like? Kind of going through that and taking fourteen years to write that. And how did it feel when you kind of got to the stage where you were able to kind of put that out into the world? Well, I will. I got to go back to go forward. My first book was called Quantum Leap Thinking: An Owner's Guide to the Mind. That took me fourteen years, and I threw it in the garbage probably ten times, cursing and yelling. I gave up. When, it came, when I finally got it to a publisher about the 10th time, it came back with 125 stickies, my poor assistant. I went nuts. I threw it in the trash can. I said, that's it. I don't, I don't care anymore. It doesn't matter. Of course I did it and became a bestseller. Then I said, I will never write another book. Never. But then all of a sudden I started to see there was a, I grew and I started to, to, to think about and make notes on this 13 year process. And originally it was called, um, uh, uh, it was called the love book. And then it was called love is the letting go of fear because the book is structured around two points, which I'll tell you. So as I cre I just decided, let's, let me look at the way I coach. Let's look at how people come to me, what I have to do and where do I want to take them? So I started to say, wow, 
I know how to end the book because if it's a CEO or there's a marital problem or there's an athlete I coach or whatever it is, at the end of the day, every single person has to let go of something, a self-image. They have to let go of anger they've been carrying around. All that stuff clutters up, actually affects the brain in a negative way. So I've got, so I know I'm always going to end, whether it's one session or two or three or four, I'm going to have them either do forgiveness exercise or I'm going to have them uh, complete something, let go of a self-image. I'll make them a tape, whatever it is. So that's the way the book ends. And then I had to go back to the beginning and say, all right, let's look at the newest brain research, which is, as you know, has been a gift. Mm -hmm. So the first part of the book I knew was going to be something, you know, okay, exceptional life. I want to define that, but I also want to come up with a metaphor for the mind that will keep people engaged. So the second chapter is about the brain and I compare it to an elephant and a rider. So because if people don't understand in a metaphorical way how the subconscious and conscious mind works, none of this stuff matters. Uh, because intellect, intelligence to me is the booby prize. So if it isn't, we don't, and one of the things I say, if I've got a bunch of, especially a bunch of CEOs in a room or a bunch of senior management, when I define something and when I show them the proof that 90% of, of us, our, our brain is, is the subconscious, which controls us and doesn't think. And 10% is that little rider on top of this elephant that, that we, that's the part that we can use to influence the 90%. I say, if you think you have control, <clears throat> over your mind, you're wrong. You don't have no control, so you better leave now if you have control issues. What you do have, you can influence your subconscious to walk. You know, we can change our paths. So it's about the tools to influence. So that became the second, the third chapter is what defining the subconscious and the second, then what are the tools that we have to reframe, to to influence uh, visualization. I know that you talk a lot about that. And um, so, so, that's, so that's how the book developed. And then, of course, it just never stopped. And then I came up with the idea, and my wife said, wait a minute, you are going to film video clips of, of uh, you're going to include video clips, and how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. It's never been done. <laughs> I said, I, so I, you know, they're on Vimeo, and uh, I've got two, two of them, um, uh, two hypnosis clips in there that I did at Lincoln Center in New York that are metaphors for the mind. Uh, uh, and we can talk about that if you want to later. And the rest of them are all practical coaching tools. So this this idea of the, the creativity and, and peak performance, some, sometimes those, those creativity and peak performance, you don't necessarily think of them in the same place you think like peak performance is like athletes and you know ceos and creativity you think is like kind of the soft tough touchy feely stuff stuff as well where, where do these two these things kind of come come together or or is that the idea of them being very separate things just a construct that we have just developed in just in terms of media and in terms of the you know the, the what kind of people think about what what the brain is actually doing when actually creativity and peak performance they're, they're very very more closely linked than we think well let me go back to the name of the book it's called imagine that so this is this is all about the imagination so i'll define this imagination is like a naughty out of control easily distracted wild child and it will be, you can grab anyone's imagination, negative, positive, good, or evil. If you watch CNN for 12 hours, your imagination goes to the dark side. If you, if you hang around with great people and you, you, know, you, you, you listen and read the positive things, it's going to go to another. So that wild child, once you apply it, and I'll do this little demonstration that I do in the book and I do with all my talks if you, for your listeners, if they imagine that they are holding a lemon, or you imagine you're holding a lemon. So I'll talk as if I'm talking to them. And you look at the lemon, and you notice it, and in a few moments, I'm going to count to two, and I want you to take a big bite out of that lemon. Now, I have a real lemon when I do this, so I say notice that it's the shape, and notice the color. And notice if you put your fingers over it, it's a little bumpy. Now cut it in half, hold up half the lemon, and squeeze it. Notice the juice. And at the count of two, I want you to just stick it in your mouth and take a big bite. One, two, and you I do this in real time. Boom! And I take a big bite out of this lemon. The juice dribbles down. 
And I ask the, um, the group, whatever the size, it doesn't matter, after I get my breath, how many of you had some kind of a reaction to this, either before, during, or after I did it? And it's, it's always the same. It's always the same. But it's about 95% of the people. And I say, this is the greatest miracle of the human mind. You just created something from nothing. And here's how you did it. You performed a creative act because I guided you to. What I asked you to do was focus, focus. That's number one. And I asked you to imagine biting a lemon. Now, if you apply your imagination, you have to have an outcome. That's called creativity. So if, if the imagination is just... You know, you're, you've got, like I do, dyslexia, your ADD, and you're kind of looking around. I can look <laughs> I can look at anything here in my office. I see a picture of me in Star Trek. I see a dummy I had <laughs> in an old thing. That, I mean, I, it's grabbing my imagination. But when you apply it, and that's a conscious effort, you have to have an outcome like the result of the lemon. The outcome could be a book. The outcome could be a relationship. The outcome could be, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, creating something to help. It could be anything. So when you apply the imagination purposefully and focus it, you have to have an outcome that's called creativity. Now, creativity, an outcome of creativity does not necessarily have to be positive. You know, it could be negative if you're on the dark side. Now, peak performance to me, is learning how to harness the imagination and use it in the best way possible for you. So it could be a book. It could be a relationship. If I worked with the Green Bay Packers once, it had to do with performance or a weightlifter. It could be a, a, a marriage. Uh, there's a chapter in here, and how do you know when you're loved? Because most people don't know what makes other people love. They only, they, they, project what makes them feel loved. And so they can be married for 25 years and still uh, go at odds. Does that answer the question at all? Yeah. I mean, I just, as you're, as you're saying, I mean, you mentioned about the, the lemon idea. And I think about as you're kind of recounting that, that story, it, it makes me think of what great writers do. You know, they, they're using the reader's imagination to fill in the blanks for them. They don't have to paint every single, single thing because we're just kind of we're kind of hardwired to to kind of complete the stories and and to, and to be creative in that way as well. Um, and I, I'm guessing, you know, with as you're talking about the the creative and, and 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 the peak performance side, I'm wondering if that if there's something around there on. I know many people who are in the either creative arts or the creative industries. They they have this expression of in, uh, inspiration is for amateurs. They're having to they can't just hope that they get inspired to create. They have to be able to almost like turn a switch and, and, and perform at a high level, kind of get into that flow state very quickly. I mean, what, what is the, what is the, in the, in the book? Um, you mentioned like a lot in terms of the science out that's coming, coming to our rescue and kind of teaching us a lot about the, what's happening in the brain when we are, you know, creating, when we're using our imagination and when we're in peak performance states. What, what does the, the science say about that ability to be able to have creativity on tap and to be able to just kind of uh, have that at your, at your beck and call? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think creativity is always a tap, but I think that we as human beings, uh, in order to unleash it, you know, that's part of what I love, unleash creativity, is there is a method to it. And, and the method for me and what I advise people is you cannot force it. You, 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 you have to be disciplined. Uh, if you wait for inspiration, you're never going to get anything done. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't have as an actor or a writer or a performer. And so what I have to do for me and what I advise people to do is first identify what creates your passion. I mean, if you don't have passion to me, and this is, this is a very personal thing, uh, then, <laughs> then you don't really want to do anything. And so I have what I try to get people right when we went back before is to identify what creates their passion, what creates their values, and then what do they want that can be manifested. And then the system is that you don't have to do it all in one day because the brain doesn't work that way, but you do have to create structure. And the reason you create structure is we are designed. You mentioned something earlier. I'm going to backtrack, then I'm going to come back here. We're designed back in our DNA to learn from stories, period. That's, that's how we learn. That's all we had, sitting around the fire, the, whatever we did. 
We're designed to learn from the story, the narrative. We are also designed to learn in this day and age from the stories we tell ourselves. The stories we tell ourselves, if you're, if you're, of, this is why I'm going back a little bit. If you look at yourself as a victim, you're, you've had it. So there's different ways to get rid of that. Coming from an acting background was interesting because I really saw in the arts, people believe that money was bad, right? That they, if they're a performer, an actor, an artist, they needed to be poor. You'd be surprised how many people believe that. That is faulty thinking <laughs> because you somehow they got this idea and they self-create the, um, the reality that they're living and then we'll complain about it. So you, the structure, the story we tell ourselves, we have to create our narrative. And that has to do with starting with our vision statement, starting with what we want to achieve, and then structuring our day for it. Like this, believe it or not, is early for me talking to you. I don't get up at 9.30. I'm up. <laughs> my wife is up at 6.30. I get up around 10.30 or 11, and I get myself going, and I got a structure. I go right down. <clears throat> to my computer for two hours, I go lift weights, I come back for two hours. I, for, for, for me, that's the ideal day because the real work, the real work doesn't ha happen when you're sitting down to your computer. The real work happens in your subconscious while you're sleeping or while you're working out or while you're meditating. I'm very big on, you know, this is to me a must, but to I don't, I maybe the word meditation, it's a little overused, but I do something and I have for since 1972, twice a day, which gives me a boost in my creative self. And that's really important. We haven't even gone there yet. So go ahead. No, it's, it's I mean, kind of what you're talking about there is, you know, it, it, which I think is great. And, and thank you for coming on, on earlier than you would normally do, because I, because I, I completely understand that in terms of knowing those, knowing those times where, where you're, you're kind of creative best often, um, and being able to structure your days around that and also having that that more unstructured time. I mean, you talk about the kind of subconscious uh, in terms of doing a lot of the heavy lifting there as well, uh, giving it that time to be able to to kind of do that work. And then the output of that is when you're sitting at the desk and writing and, and revising. And yes. Editing and, all and, and, part, and every single client I have, I make an MP3 for that's 15 minutes long. That is a guided, well, it's really a visualization. I have them, you know, they go through their body and relax. They imagine a color flowing through their body, a place outdoors, they're totally relaxed. And this, the, the last part is a suggestion. And so they listen to that twice a day. And it so far, it's never failed. I mean, whether it's healing or pain or motivation or self-confidence, uh, this works, you know, it's not back in the day when I started, I don't know who the top speakers were back in the seventies for you, but for me, they were Zig Ziglar, W. Clement Stone, Robert Schuller. Yeah. I think, you know, and I knew all these guys and, uh, Lou Holtz and, and on it went, this stuff worked and no one knew why there was no brain research, hmm. but now all of a sudden, all this beautiful brain research is no, now we know why it works. And I, this is my opinion about what's going on in the speaking market is back in the seventies and eighties, this was called soft stuff, creativity. How do you run your mind? How do you do this? All that. So then you, you got more into forecasting and you know, there, I didn't, but there were speakers that <clears throat> would, would go into many different things than me. I think now is the time for this soft stuff to be brought back and marketed again to the millennials, to the corporations, because people really are so busy that they don't do what is necessary to live this life to the fullest and the most creatively and productively, yeah. by the way. I, and, and also the, the other reason why I think it's so, this is so important, kind of what you're saying and, and the kind of work you're doing around, around creativity is because with all we we are seeing in terms of what's going to be happening with artificial intelligence, robots, automation, frankly, they will be taking many of the jobs over the next twenty years. Forty percent of jobs will go because they'll be used. You know, by you know, you'll have machines and and robots and AI doing many of those more kind of routine jobs and routine tasks. 
which is fantastic for us as humans, potentially, if it's used in the right way, because it allows it releases us to be to do the things which computers aren't so good at doing, i.e. the creative bit, <laughs> the, the strategizing, the, the looking for connections between things, the imagination. Um, so it's, it's actually a, I think it's actually quite a good time to be a, to be a human because we've got this potentially this, this new um, collaborator in the creative work we do with through technology and AI. Oh, absolutely. I think it's. For, for me, it's fabulous. There's no complaints on my end be, because you still need what we do. <laughs> you know, we still need what yeah. we do. Now, maybe some jobs are going to be taken away. That's true. And that's why I coach students to think about the future in terms of where they can fit in and where they can make the biggest difference, where they can have the most fun. Fun is a very important part of my life. My top three values, by the way, which run my life. Number one is love. And I don't mean that in a corny way, not being in love. It's just you either have I, I, this book is structured around two emotions, love or fear, period. When one exists, the other doesn't exist. And that's a whole nother conversation that I love. I got a chapter on just fear. Fear is my playground. And secondly, is is that we if we can live if we can live in the realm of possibility and and want to teach others how to become bigger. And this is what I say to students, how to become better. Look in the future and where do you imagine that to be? And you open it up to students, especially. I don't do a lot of students anymore, but it's, but it's, it's a lot of fun, as you probably know, because they're open and they're scared. So you get them to look in the future and say, okay, yeah, so where do you fit in? What do you think you want to do? My top three values, number one is love, number two is freedom, and number three is fun. And fun is extremely important to me. When I don't have it, I get sad. So there's nothing in life, whether it's cleaning some, you know, I was working in a barn yesterday, storing away my 47 Chevy, and it's all mice and it's horrible. And, other, and I, I put on some Jimmy Buffett music and made it fun because it's, it's important. It's important to look at all the stuff we're talking about, creativity, peak performance, not as something as serious as some people put it. It's fun. It playing in your mind is is when you start to understand that you've got tools that you can learn. I wish somebody had taught me this in kindergarten uh, about reframing or about using. How do you use negative thinking for positive results? How do you how do you take all this negative stuff and turn? Why it's fun, and uh, I think. I know that students have a lot have have a lot of ga uh, big gas with this. They they they, they play. So in this creative journey that you've gone through as a, you know, as a speaker, as an, as an author, um, as, a, as a performer and actor as well, can you point to one particular aha moment, some a light bulb moment in your life where you went, oh, OK, this was like a, a key decision you made or, or a key insight that you had about your life and, and, and the vision that you wanted of your life? Well, I'm going to work backwards where you ended. I never had a vision for my life uh, in, in the, in the sense of what was I going to be doing 25 years from now? When I started acting in the early seventies, I was an actor and I produced theaters. Then I, I started, it, it didn't fulfill me. So I was acting and I, and I, you know, I saw Kreskin on TV and I said, I can do that. <laughs> so I put together a show. There were three of us only in the United States uh, who did this kind of a show. And then I said, I think I'll write a screenplay in addition to this. So it always was what is fun. And I had to survive. So I had to earn money. And I think the biggest aha going backwards, if I could advise anyone to do anything, I'd say everybody take an acting course. And the reason is you're going to have creativity. It's going to serve you in every single thing you do, whether it's a job interview or a relationship, because most people think that acting is somehow phony. Acting is being legitimate. It's being authentic. Uh, Clint Eastwood, I hung out with Anthony Hopkins has been my coach and all of them are authentic. You believe them. When you take an acting course, and that was a big aha for me, is that I could apply everything I learned from method acting from this to everything I do, including my writing. So for me, the aha moment was that. The second aha moment was uh, about eight years ago, I was shooting a film in Scotland. Now, you may know, uh, you probably do. This was a British director by the name of Robin Hardy. And he did a film called The Wicker Man. 
it was a th- thriller kind of cult film. And, yeah, with um, and I'm trying to remember that it was the the the, the act who was the gentleman that was uh-huh. Edward, Woodward, Edward Woodward, Red Woodward, Eklund, and Christopher Lee. And this fellow saw my hypnosis show years ago and tried to cast me in about three or four films and lost a lot of money. Not with me, but he couldn't do it. So he so he called me up one day. And he said, I got a part for you. This is eight years ago. I'm doing a sequel to The Wicker Man. And I'm not going to go into this. It was a f- fabulous role. I went to Scotland to shoot it for, for, for two weeks. And, and it really was good and physically demanding. And I'm not a young guy. I'm 72 years old. And it was so that was 60. You know, I was competing, not competing. We're working with 18-year-olds. And then I got home and I got depressed back in Connecticut here. And I went to my doctor three days later. And I found out I had less than a month to live. I had an aortic aneurysm, um, and I maybe would have two weeks to live. So that opened up. That was a big change for me. And the big change was that I got, I got to take it. I had to have open heart surgery. I developed a program, which is now embraced by Yale, uh, to help surgery patients. It's a DISC program. And what it, what it taught me was that I am not going to hang around anyone. Because when you're in that state and you're healing, you have to be surrounded by positive people. You can't be around people who are crying and worrying about you. You have to really, because you're so sensitive. That moment, I said, when I'm healed, and I will, I'll be back lifting weights, I am not going to ever be around anyone who vexes the spirit. My wife is right there with me with this. So if we are go to a party, say, and you, we meet someone, and you just know this person is an energy sucker, <laughs> a vampire of creativity. Mm. We know we're that sensitive, and so that we have here are very, you know, we have a lot of playwrights and actors and directors, and they're very successful. We cheerlead everybody. If somebody has a success, we throw them a party. It inspires us. It makes us grow bigger. So surrounding yourself with people who are positive, who are smart, who are loving, uh, who you like is that was an aha moment for me. And, and yeah, go ahead. What, what did that, what did that experience? I mean, that, I mean, I can't imagine what that must be like to be told by your doctor. You only have very limited time uh, left as you know to say as you say when none of us are getting out of this alive but you you when you're given such a, a a very fixed kind of period like that and then you manage to get through it how did you know you mentioned like getting rid of the energy vampires in your life what else did it change in terms of the way that you you saw your work and 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 the, that's, the that's role of your work good, and good question impact? yeah because at first when i found out I was beyond terrified. And you, how could you not? Because it goes to your DNA. It goes to the, the subconscious. You're, you're dying. I mean, that you could die. And so in order for me to survive, I realized I had to actually read my first book. You know that? <laughs> After all these years. But I realized that in order to heal and survive, I had to get my attention off my fear. I had to turn my fear into energy which is extremely important. So the lesson and what I did, I said, look, all right, I could die, but I am going to become a partner in my wellness. I am going to learn everything I can about this. And, and I'm going to go into this. And I actually created a recording, which is now part of the recording that Yale School of Medicine uses of using visualization uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go into this whole thing, but I will, t- I will t- t- tell you this third day in ICU, I asked, um, my wife is a journalist, so she had a little pad of paper and I was croaking my question to a senior nurse. And I said, does attitude make a difference? Now I'm still in bad shape. The nurse said, no one has ever asked us this. She said, let me tell you a story. She said, I see people all the time who should not have had any problems, but they did. And those were almost always the people who were not grateful, who yelled at us, who criticized us, who fought with their visiting relatives or friends or didn't have any relatives or friends. They were angry people. And there were a lot of people that should have had a lot greater problems, and they didn't. And those were almost always the people that had a different kind of attitude. They were grateful 
They were kind. They were loving. They thanked us, and they had a great support system around them. So that was the beginning of my exploration of two years of visiting hospitals, surgeons, and coming up with five or six points that I've incorporated in the book about become a, becoming a partner in your own wellness, but that also could be becoming a partner in your own creativity or your own peak performance. No one is going to do this for you. Uh, if you're a victim, you're going to live one life. Victim means that, oh, poor me, and people should be helping me. No, nobody should be doing anything. You create this. And the way you create it, to me, I say, um, and this is part of what I believe, is you give on a continuous basis and help people whenever you can. That's how you form a system in your life. So I'll give product away. I'll give books away. I'll give my time away. Um, because, and I don't do it to get it back, but it does come back. Uh, and that creates a synergy that is, supports my creative life and my dreams. Now we'll be talking a lot about some of your books here, but if there was one book, uh, that you could recommend to our listeners and we're going to have, we're going to have links to your, your new book, Imagine That as well. And we'll have links to, to your other works. Well, but if there was one book by another author that you think our, our listeners should, should read to check out, what would that Man's Search be? for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Fine. As, as you, do you know what, as you were saying that all about the, the attitude thing, that's the first book that came into my mind as You're well. You're kidding. Because you it, it's, it really, it, it really speaks to that. It really speaks to that. It's this, this idea that, and if any, if anyone hasn't read the book, Man's Virtual Meaning, it was, he was a, a concentration, uh, uh, um, prisoner in the Second World War. And, and he was interested being, I think he was a, he was a, a, psych, a yes. psychologist and he was interested in, what led some people to be able to to live to be able to get through this terrible terrible event and what and how other people just were not able to deal with it and then that you you can use that word attitude as well and i think that's a that's a, a lot of it kind of ties into what you've been saying to uh to victor frankl's book so we'll put that link here as well you're mentioning just kind of putting your your car away for the winter as well having some music playing what would be the one record one album that you would recommend that people check out <laughs> Oh, I don't know that they're going to like this. I have both my light and dark side that I play all the time. <laughs> I play Leonard Cohen on one side and I play Jimmy Buffett on the other. So <laughs> I, I mean, I just do. I love musical comedy. So I'm always, I have music on almost all the time. When I write, I play Gregorian chants. When I, when I'm, um, when I'm researching, I'll play, uh, Chris Smithers or Leonard Cohen or, or, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, it depends on my mood. Music is a very important part of my life, except, uh, when I, when I really have to, you know, the, I, uh, I'm working on this new project now for this, this wellness seminar, I'm playing music because I'm recreating and reinventing things I've done in the past. But when I really have to be quiet, I have to be quiet. And I was going to go back to Viktor Frankl because we left one very important thing out. The lesson yeah. I got out of it was that you always have a choice of how to react to any circumstance that you're put into, always. And that you cannot be a victim if you embrace that mm -hmm. idea. Absolutely. Let's imagine finally if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools you trade, all the knowledge you have acquired over the years, but no one knows you. You know no one. You have to to restart. You have to start again. What would you do? How would you restart? If I if I had the knowledge I have now, uh, oh, wouldn't that be a gift? How would I start? Um, I think the first thing I would do is create the ideal simple workshop and start doing it locally in the community for free. Uh, that's one thing I do uh, immediately. So I get off my feet and I start producing something. Um, I would join a local theater group <laughs> and I would write some kind of a simple manual. I mean, this, this book is, 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 of richness, but it but it's not simple. You gotta you gotta work. And I'd write a simple manual for people to 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 uh, to embrace some of these ideas. And I'd go out doing it locally for free, and that's what I do. 
Yep. Well, James, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. Um, imagine that igniting your brain for creativity and peak performance is out now. We're going to have a link here as well at jamestaylor.me. Just type in uh, James Mapes and you'll be able to see all these links that we've been speaking about today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I hope I get a chance to, to hear you uh, speak live on a stage at some point or a workshop at some point. It's been an absolute pleasure about hearing about your renaissance life. Well, thank you, thank you. And one of these days I'm going to come over there because I want to see Darren Brown do his big show. So <laughs> so maybe we can get together. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.